Holy hell. <laughs> Cut it in post. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Hello and welcome to the only podcast on YouTube, Stolen Nostalgia. I am Sandwich TV, and I am joined by my co-host and wife, Cassandra Lynn. Titles, titles. On this maiden voyage of the podcast, we are discussing a topic of nostalgia from both our childhoods, Alice in Wonderland. Now, Alice in Wonderland seems to always be able to find its way into media, whether it be in film, television, or even video games. The story of Alice is very translatable and seems to speak to people of all generations. So this then begs the question, why reinvent the wheel if it's rolling along just fine? Now, Cassie, I know that you you have more insight to the book than I do. Like, I don't even think I've actually read the book. And really? Yeah, like, honest to God, I don't think I've ever read Alice in Wonderland. So, the original was written by Lewis Carroll um, in 1865, aptly titled Alice in Wonderland. Um, and it's just about, the general like story about it is it's just about a young girl and kind of all the mishaps, not necessarily, I don't know if I would call it that, just adventures, I guess, that she gets into. Um just by being curious about life and that very, very like naive childlike imagination of everything and Mm. how it can run wild. Um, And then the second story is through the looking glass, but that's not what we're covering here. That was the second book he wrote. Have you, have you read that one? Yes. And is is there a dragon in it? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> stop teasing earlier stuff <laughs> no there's a surprisingly not which interesting <laughs> but um i mean how many books do i have down there probably 40 yeah all the same book <laughs> ish yes and no most of them are just the alice in wonderland story some of them are coupled with through the looking glass because that's like the sequel or I guess second part of Alice in Wonderland. Well, just looking at I... some of the titles I even see here on the bookshelf, there's some interesting takes on this, like The Dark Side of Alice in Wonderland. Yes, that one's an interesting book, and I think I have like three others that that in and of itself is like a retelling of, you know, Alice is not that naive or that innocent, or the story of it isn't that sweet. Hmm. Like it just divulges, and I know we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, just about adapta- adaptations of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I have some of those books that are not the story that was told or written by Lewis Carroll, for sure. Right. So I feel like, yeah, having never read the book, my only my only nostalgia for Alice in Wonderland is the 1950, was it 51? 1950. Yeah, I mean, that's... That is the way that I think, especially everyone of our generation, um, and probably till the early 2000s, to be honest, knew. That's all we knew of Alice was the 1951 version that, you know, when Disney recreated it. um, I know that you said the 1985 version was one. That's one that I'd seen a lot of. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that. The original um, Disney for... version for me, I I remember. I can't tell you like the first time I saw it, but it was always it was always kind of within you know that collection of Disney movies on the shelf, like Little Mermaid, you know, yes, Aladdin, they all, Pinocchio. They all are very like in the similar vein. Like when we were watching these and talking about them, it really hit heavy with me, especially being older and the nostalgia of it, of like how much it was like other Disney movies. To me, it was like the top tier era of Disney. Um, and that's when, you know, the one that most of us know, the most iconic version, I guess I should say, of Alice in Wonderland is from 1951 and Disney's animated retelling of it. And that is actually something to be said, the most iconic, like the, if you think Alice in Wonderland, I think most people think of that blonde haired, like big blue dress with the little apron in front, big blue eyes, very soft spoken girl. Um, The absolute zaniness of that cartoon movie is, I mean, it stands out a lot. Um, That was, we had recently rewatched that and for this podcast. And so what I think... 
there was a couple of interesting things about that one that I really number one I just there was this like there's this whimsy of like that orchestra that like breaks into the titles and like and a lot of the old Disney movies kind of started like the like, Pinocchio started that way I'm pretty sure Cinderella and like they all just kind of started with that you know that old like it's like old school black and white kind of movies all movies started with the titles and with all the casts and with the anime and everything all the all the credits came before a film um I don't know if you know that, but there there's something interesting about that where that only started recently changing. Uh, yeah, it's not. Um, it's not like a, a thing in movies anymore. Where to me, to me, in my opinion, this is without a doubt the best version of it. And to me, that screams my nostalgia, having grown up in the '90s. Yep. Like this is all I knew for so long, because then all I did besides that was read the book growing up and then it was you know only after my love and appreciation for the story continued to you know change and grow in different ways over time that I learned about honestly other versions other adaptations other everything about it but to do you me, feel like, like it's a very faithful adaptation yes really I, I like when we were watching um we were watching back just different versions of it uh, I think the 51, and maybe it's because my introduction, that is my introduction to Alice in Wonderland. So maybe, maybe I, I feel like I do rate everything against that to me because that is like the cream of the crop in my opinion. Um, well, and even the animation style is very well done. It's fascinating when I think we, it holds up. yes, when we were deep diving on all of this stuff, like doing our research, the first film uh, came out in 1915 and was black and white. Um, and then it even goes so far into a cartoon that was made this year that's like, I would say probably more like toddler kind of youth group era for it. Yeah. Um, even more so, way more so than the Disney one. It's like very like Daniel Tiger aspect, like very, very young, where it's like her baking. <laughs> it's a baking <laughs> show. <laughs> Well, and like even and, the but it's very even cute. the nineteen even the nineteen fifty one, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a silent film. Um, oh, I don't know that. Um, let me double check real quick. But like I said, the, the book was written in 1865, so it's been over 150 years of everyone having an opportunity and a go at this. And the reason that people can do that with this is because it's public domain. I believe the right. original copyright on it only lasted for about 40 years. I may be mistaken. But since that copyright ended, that's where you see the very first film in like 1915. And it's just literally, if you look up, I was blown away when you look up on just YouTube or even like IMDb or anything like that. There are dozens of versions in dozens of countries, different translations, different languages. Everybody's taken a spin at this, like truly. So that's where Everybody. I was actually, yeah, so that's where I was actually a little wrong. It's 1903 and it is a silent film. Mm, see, I didn't even know about that one. I thought 1915 was the first one in all my research. That's what I had come across. That's, so yeah. it's like, th I think this is such an ever adapting story. And this just, I'll, I'll mention this more and maybe like the honorable mentions part we're going to talk about later. But just like this story is so complex. <laughs> how many really different is. avenues it takes, how many different time periods. Everybody says something different about her and the story and the actual Alice Little and everything. But I'll, I can deep dive into that later. As far as adaptation is concerned, too. You know, it's understand and like I definitely understand adaptation is something where especially if you're talking about like you see this kind of come up a lot with any book to TV or book to movie series. Harry Potter is a great example. Lord of the Rings. These Lord of the Rings is probably one of the most definitive book adaptations, but still had to omit quite a bit of the story. Um, and even in the extended editions of that film series, like they still weren't able to fully get everything in. And they also kind of changed a lot of the story elements to make it work more narratively for, a, from a film perspective. Um, so, you know, Harry Potter is another example where it's like, you, they have to omit quite a bit from the book in order to, you know, con consolidate it all into like a two hour film. Another thing to be noted about the Disney version is that it was an hour and 
what, like an hour 20, and a half? I think it was an hour and 21 hour, minutes. Yeah, then. hour and 21 minutes. Able to really convey a lot of the elements there pretty pretty well. Um, like you said, the, the book is, is, you know, it's based on... The way that she describes it in the very beginning of that movie is if I had my own world, it would all be nonsense, right? And what's so great about that is that that movie then genuinely unfolds into a bunch of nonsense. Yes, and nothing scary. It's very much the curiouser and curiouser mindset, 100%. Right. And I feel like that so far, and again, I haven't watched all of them. It seems like there's countless different versions yeah, to watch, really is. clearly. Um, but I feel like that is the most represent like representative representational i guess is that the right word i would say um i think it just represents the story the best which i'm not obviously going to lose sight of the fact that even in its own right that is an entirely different adaptation than the original sure so my nostalgia is based in the 1951 but i i do believe in everything that we watched though the 1985 Live action was terrifying to me, and I hated it, but it was the most... The parts that talked about Alice's story were the most accurate to what Lewis Carroll originally wrote. Right. And what's interesting to me is... So, like, that being said, is, like, I feel like... I I would almost argue, having not even seen them, because of how things were made back in the day, I feel like even some of the... Like, the 1915 and the 1903 and like all i've seen one from like 1930 something like i feel like all of those were probably very faithful adaptations as well because there wasn't a whole lot of reason to i think the idea beyond that well because the new medium was film right so like they already had a thing going for them where they're like now see it on on a screen like see the story told out in in real time yeah and i feel like there was no need to embellish or or exaggerate or you know omit or change or elaborate off of anything i feel like the 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 whole idea behind being able to just see a story being told on a screen was the appeal enough and so there is an argument to be made where like you know for a while it's like you could have your cake and eat it too and that was just good enough for everybody but then you come along to like the disney version that really especially the vibrant colors the kind of psychedelic trip that they were able to make happen with that that I mean, we looked at a lot of the animation in that film when we watched it, and like it was extremely clever. The, some of the creatures they were coming up with, it was so um, cool. little umbrella birds, and like just the flowers and how the flowers were all like kind of condemning her for not being a flower. The horse and, like, fly that was a seahorse. Yeah, like and the butter bread butterfly. The butter, the butterflies the bread that were butterfly? bread. <laughs> the butter bread flies or I don't, bread I butter can't remember flies. what they call them. <laughs> but just all these little little you know creative uh liberties taken with with the literature itself like based on your remembering of memory of the book is is there anything is there any details of like the things she's in, she encounters in Wonderland or um, are, are they Yes because yes because all the characters that you see um like the dodo and mm. you know the flamingos and that's all very iconic to the original story itself. Mm -hmm. I feel like Disney Disney did in this movie what Disney used to in my opinion used to be good at doing was making things on some other level of fantasy. Yeah. And I I another reason why I think this is the best version is because this is the way that as a child knowing about the story, like this was the only way for it to be told the right way. Right. And that's very biased of me, sure. But I just think like when going back, like having read the book as a kid, of course I don't remember, you know, how I felt at the time, but rereading it as an adult and everything, it just is like it has more of that Victorian era vibe, a little right. drabby, like a little monotone in some things, whereas I feel like it's worthy of this fantastical, whimsical story, and that's what the 1951 version of Disney did for me. That's why I love this story. It did a really good job with that, kind of in the sense of when she is talking to the caterpillar, too, and like having to recite her, her little sonnets and stuff. Yes, um, that, that, that harkens back to the Victorian of what right. they were expected to do, of course. The education but... and everything else. 
I mean, it's just so vast because, like I said, 150 years, it's been a TV show, which I think you can still find even on Netflix and like Amazon Prime. There's been movies. There's been movies made for TV specifically. There's There's been music. Games. Think about Jefferson yeah. Airplane and, and go ask Alice and, you know, feed your yeah, head it's... and all that stuff. Like there's there's a lot of it, it clearly, uh, especially and that was like in the late 60s, early 70s. So it clearly you know it found a pulse in mainstream to where even even a rock and roll band uh yes you know wanted to you know it was inspired by it and i think that that do you, that that's something i would say is like it's inspiring and maybe that is another key cornerstone to nostalgia is you know what it inspires you to do what it makes you want to you know seek out in the world um some of the other film adaptations that we looked at like the the 1985 one, we'll, we looked at the most, and that was one that I remember growing up watching. And it was interesting as we watched it. I remembered, like visually, I remember a lot of it. And honestly, I thought that one did a fairly good job in the sense of like. So we talked a little bit about this because it has a lot of musical numbers that aren't the original musical numbers. And it, you were like, "What the hell is this?" And I remember thinking, <laughs> <The> like, '85. <85. laughs> well, I was like, you know, they had all these kind of like. I mean, they had um. They had uh, Sammy Davis Jr. in there as the caterpillar, and I was like, if you if you get someone like Sammy Davis Jr., you're going to have him sing and like tap dance and stuff, and so that that whole movie that whole movie is like a variety sh like a variety hour show, like that's what it is. It had all these kind of like like more or less like big names, but kind of like you know, at the time '85 when that came out, these were like. These were like the cabaret kind of big names that were kind of dying out. This was like the end of the Rat Pack era kind of people. Um, you know, just that kind of it's like my dad would know every single person in that movie, you know? Yeah. I mean, I can categorize that as being nostalgic for its time. It was appropriate for the time that it came out. Now I think it was absolutely terrifying to watch and trying to take a live action stance on the story is gross. <laughs> well, it was clearly <laughs> a made for like TV. <laughs> so the budget they had, I thought that they did a lot of really interesting things. Um, what's interesting most about that, too, is it also still f remained fairly faithful to the story. It, you know, the yes. adaptation of what was going on when we were looking at certain scenes of her meeting the rabbit and having to get his gloves and all this stuff. And we were kind of like racking our brains. That's I feel like it was the most accurate to the book. I mean, at least comparing it to everything else that I watched, mm -hmm. the parts that were talking about Alice and her story in there were the book to a T. Well, and what's interesting, too, is, again, the only thing I noticed that was different, really, that was, like, a, a bit contrast to, like, the 1950 Disney was uh, the girl's dress was, like, red-orange instead of blue. Mm, um, but still, yeah. she had that she had that golden-white blonde hair. Like, the, you know, I, I felt like she was she was even, like, of the more appropriate age of Alice, I felt like, too. Um, yes. So, like, just because Alice is meant to be, like, anywhere from, like, 7 to 10. So, you know, it, it just makes the most sense. Um and then we didn't we didn't finish it because I don't think you could have. But, I couldn't um, do it. I just couldn't fair. do it. We also didn't finish another movie that we're going to talk it's, about. Yeah. I mean, the 85 is, you know, what, four years before I was born. It's just not it's not a version of it's just not my time era of anything. See, and that for didn't... me was like the era of like Raggedy Ann and Andy and like all that kind of stuff at Sesame Street. So like all of that kind of made for TV stuff was the pinnacle of what you could get on a TV budget. And so, I mean, for me, especially at the time, I remember watching that at my grandmother's house a lot. And that just being like, for whatever reason, that being the version that they showed us. And like, I'd, I'd still seen the 1950s one a few times too, but it was just one of those things that I remember more vividly, I guess. And I don't know why. Like, it had, like, Scott Bayo in it and stuff. And that was, you know, again, for someone of my generation, like, that was, it was strange to watch it now and look at that and be like, oh, my God, Scott Bayo. And, like, that was probably a terrible role. Like, everyone, that's another thing that was interesting <laughs> about that movie. They all looked so miserable. They all looked really unhappy being a part of this film. Like, and then yes. that, that gave you an idea of, like, kind of, like, this has-beens kind of thing. Like, these were bigger names and Sammy Davis Jr., man. I mean, these were big names in Hollywood and now they were relegated to doing an Alice in Wonderland made for TV variety hour show. Like that was just, that's weird. <laughs> As a babe that was born in 89 and raised in the 90s, all of that is irrelevant to me. 
<laughs> I, I didn't know these people. I don't care about these people. And they were scary in their makeup. But that being said, the 1950s one still spoke and rang true to you. And that's yes, an interesting thing. That also shows the timelessness, not is. just of the story, but of that animation style and of how they were able to convey that story. Because I grew up on Disney. Now, we both you know. have a son. <laughs> and our son is a bigger fan of the next version that has oh donned this silver screen. Um, everyone in pretty pretty much, I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of the Tim Burton version of Alice in Wonderland. And what's interesting is he prefers this version over the 1950 Alice in Wonderland. And that speaks to his era. In a way, but it also shows, I think it's because he saw that one first, though, too. Yeah. And it's not well, even a yeah. matter of speaking to his era, because that movie came out before he was born. Um, in the sense that, like, I think, it, you know, there's something that you can make an argument about, like, special effects-wise and all these different things that, is, I mean, because it came out in 2010, and, it, I mean, the effects kind of hold up. Um you can tell the entire movie that they're on a green screen. Like that's the most horrifying thing yeah. to me. Yeah, to him, to him though, that that is the story of Alice in Wonderland. That's terrible. That's what he uh. saw first. <laughs> I mean, I we've had him go back and rewatch. He's watched. I don't think he's watched anything else besides the 1951 because that's on Disney Plus and it's easily accessible. But he, after he had watched that version of it, he's like, I like the the newer one with the people. So let's go back for a second and talk about Tim Burton for a minute, because this is something that I find very interesting. So Tim Burton is, is at least for when I was growing up watching Tim Burton films. So the, the films that I grew up watching, uh, Beetlejuice, phenomenal Tim Burton film. You look at something like even Edward Scissorhands, Ed Wood. These are all movies that Tim Burton designed and created from his own mind. Now, Ed Wood was a real guy, but it was Burton's, you know, uh, telling of Ed Wood's life, or at least a, a certain portion of his life um, when he came into Hollywood. Then you look at something like Batman, Tim Burton's Batman, and even Batman Returns. Now, the aesthetics, like the way that Tim Burton makes his films look. And then you move into the era of when he did like Nightmare Before Christmas and he started kind of gravitating towards other things. These were all still very original ideas from Tim Burton's mind. And especially when you look at something like Beetlejuice, right? Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, these are kind of like the pinnacle of Burton, uh, like Burton aesthetics. And you see his style, and it's unmistakable. You get Danny Elfman is doing the music for his movies. Like, that collaboration, like, all of these things are, are absolutely phenomenal films, and also icons in their own right. So you think getting someone like Tim Burton coupled with Alice in Wonderland would be, like, a real good idea... But then watching this movie, for me, this movie was like, it was so weird. It was like someone else trying to do a Tim Burton film. And for me, this is when Tim Burton started to fall off. Like 100% have I thought everything he's done since, maybe since this or even slightly before this movie, I, I feel like it's just hot garbage. Um, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know. I think, honestly, this is where I can make an argument that visual effects and CGI and stuff has really ruined careers for people because what was great about Tim Burton was the practicality of his effects, the way he was able to make these things. He would do claymation and stuff like that, but just... I mean, the set pieces, the designs that they would come up with for stuff, like if you look at something like Beetlejuice and the Sandworm and just like these really... these odd creations... He is almost like a Lewis Carroll in himself, right? Like, so it's interesting to see when you were giving him this this story to adapt, how he just could fail so miserably in the visuals. Um, that's really where this took me out of it a little bit, because for one thing, I'll make a note here. Alice in Wonderland does not pair well with Tim Burton's muted color scheme. That is a big issue that I have with this. Uh, the whole movie is like washed out in gray and like sepia tones. And that's not Alice in Wonderland. Um, I mean, I don't think that I don't think that anything could really save it, I, I, much less not letting Burton direct it. I think what's interesting to me is so there's an argument to be made that this movie, uh, I've seen this online too, that this movie is a continuation to Alice in Wonderland 1951. And we they kind of maybe hint at that a little bit in the film. They don't really give it direct. Um, but 
then why package it as Alice in Wonderland? And this is where we get into the the stolen nostalgia, because this is why I feel like this was meant to on two fronts this was meant to appeal to our generation number one you have tim burton directing and everyone's like oh i loved beetlejuice number two you have it called alice in wonderland and everyone's like oh alice in wonderland i grew up watching that movie and so that gets butts and seats and i feel like that was like maybe there was studio involvement here and it really stifled him but at the same time i just feel like maybe he's just not as good of a filmmaker as he once was um and i that this is where I get insulted watching this movie. Like, we started to watch this movie, and the the biggest issue I have is I don't know why they tried to make Alice more grown up and, like, but still, like, a child at the same time. Like, I didn't understand where they were trying to go with that. Like, she clearly was over the age of 18. Um, she's getting married now, which is never in the story. Like, I don't know. What were your thoughts, like, looking at some of the beginning scenes of this movie? What I was going to say, talking about, because you mentioned, you mentioned films about Tim Burton, and I wholeheartedly agree with you that this just wasn't him. Um, And you talked about, like, Claymation, you mentioned The Nightmare Before Christmas, even through to 2005, like, he did Corpse Bride, I was a fan. Of course, Beetlejuice... I was a fan of Frank and Weenie. Like I told you, I was okay with some Sweeney Todd. I couldn't get behind it, but like Sleepy Hollow. And you know my favorite movie, Big Fish. Like I have championed him. I loved what he did in 9 in 2009. I thought that was a good film. And then James and the Giant Peach. So it's just like, yes, I hold him. I, I guess maybe, let me correct my phrasing here. I used to hold him on a different level as like an actual artist and then watching this Alice in Wonderland version what the absolute shit <laughs> was that <laughs> he was not an artist he slapped his name on it none of it felt like him I could see maybe I had high hopes and felt really good in the beginning of this like you had mentioned didn't care much for Alice being probably in that time, realistically, like 15, 16, because that's when. Do you in think that that's what they were, were getting portraying? Married. Yes, because mm. that that was an average time around that era for them to get married. Because at best, she could pull off like 25. <laughs> yeah, but best from our perspective, I, I honestly know. felt like she was like 23 in there trying to get married. And it's like. It just felt like too many different things. First, we're in Victorian era, which I guess I could say that he's trying to hearken to Lewis Carroll there. Um, I guess I could see it. You know, his, again, adaptation. This is his version of it. I just is think it, it was really shittily done. It didn't feel like him. There was no artistry to it. And I know thousands of people upon millions of people may disagree with that because you wouldn't have the movies that you have today, especially in like the superhero genre, without everything being green screen. And I think, and this is even calling to Johnny Depp in this personally, I feel like the last movie that I watched where I thought that it was needed and felt like it added to the story was in the original Pirates of the Caribbean mm. that Johnny Depp was in. So it's like, again... Totally bias of me, but I think everything since then is garbage and I don't like it. And I miss like actual real life special effects. And sure, again, 1951 was an entirely animated series, but I feel like if you're adding people into a story, you can't just have one person through the entire movie that is a human being basically besides snippets of Johnny Depp. Like, even the, like, Helen's head, I cannot remember her last name, but Helen. Helena was, Bonham Carter. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Helena, she was, not Helen. <laughs> Helena. Um, she was the Red Queen. Her head was huge for what purpose? Who even knows? Because it's quirky, I guess. Um, well, and, like, that's the thing that upset her a lot in the movie was, like, and, like, people needed to have, like, crazy, like, yeah, deformities be, or, like. It just. To Again, be in her court. <laughs> I, I guess I can err on the side of that's his adaptation. But then 
the other person that was her um uh, whatever the guy was that was like with her all the time he was completely cgi'd body because he was so that tall was so and weird. skinny that was so gross and like and it being crispin glover really threw me off <laughs> and to deep dive into just like what a damn shame in my opinion for johnny depp because mm-hmm. i know that him i know that tim burton and johnny depp go hand in hand he is in honestly probably over a dozen or more of tim burton's creations no and way so it can't I, be that many yes really? yes yes um well so hold on least... he he did corpse bride right he was in sleepy hollow edward scissorhands he was edward scissorhands edward. what else did he do alice in wonderland charlie and the chocolate factory sweeney todd sweepy hollow i don't think he was in big fish why am i lacking that here let me just let's take a little peek at johnny depp Okay, so they've done. Uh, doo, doo, doo. He was in Edward Scissorhands in 1990, Ed Wood in 1994, Sleepy Hollow in 1999, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in oh, 2005, right. Corpse Bride 2002, Sweeney Todd in 2007. I keep forgetting about that one. <laughs> Alice in Wonderland 2010, Dark Shadows 2012, and then he's again the Mad Hatter in Alice Through the Looking Glass. So how many was that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wow. So it's like I know I know that they go hand in hand. I get that's his bestie. (laughs) But holy shit, what a shame. Because especially we watched this before rewatching the 1951 version. Mm -hmm. And like The Mad Hatter in the 1951 is so nonsense and whimsical. You can't just make that be his outfit. I just um, was disappointed. Disappointed in Tim Burton. Disappointed in the role that was given to Johnny Depp. Disappointed in his portraying of it. It almost feels like, why the Scottish accent? The other thing is like... He was almost still stuck in like being in Pirates of the Caribbean, but like resisting being mad. And that's what this role called for. And then we had the, um, honestly, spoilers, because we're deep diving into so much about the film here. But like the uh, the dog, the bloodhound and that whole set, like why? One thing I was going to say about Johnny Depp too, like after rewatching the 1950 version and seeing how... I mean, for a cartoon especially, like, a a very captivating scene with the Mad Hatter. Um, Seeing him with the the March Hare and, like, the whole, like, you know, cup empty, like, move down, move down, like, all all the craziness that was happening. Like, it would have been... That would have been so cool. Incredible to see Depp really just unhinge in that role and just piling all over the table and, like, doing weird things like that. Um, I think that they made him, I think Tim Burton's take on that was him stepping on the table to go get Alice. That was, if that's his extent of madness, that was like terrible. that wasn't enough. That was stupid. Yeah, well, the whole thing. Well, but remember, he can do a dance. He can do a funky little dance, and that makes God. him mad. The, the dumbest part of that was you could tell... Literally, any time a dance move happened, they zoomed in so his face wasn't in it, so you knew it was a body double. Right. He ain't dancing. He ain't dancing. He shouldn't be dancing, period. That movie does not need that in it any doesn't. way, shape, or form. <laughs> and so that's the thing I was, I was thinking about, like, you know, is is that, like, a scene that appeals to someone of our son's generation? Like, is that a scene that that yes. is like a standout and like yes because like so much of their movies are with movement you think true. like happy feet is penguin singing and dancing the whole time like that is their version of things it's just so bizarre to me because it's not him and it's not the story that i know and it's, it's nothing not. i enjoyed and i hated cheshire cat in it and i loathed why are we making her a hero why did we make her falling down the hole scary? Why is she fighting a dragon? Why is she in armor? Literally none of that 
is any of the story of Alice in Wonderland. So that's another so, interesting point to make up or bring up too is the falling down the hole because you said that you always look at, at any adaptation of how how is it how did they make her fall down the hole? It was terrifying. I even felt this a little bit in the 85 which I didn't appreciate version, but mm-hmm. like it was scary. In yeah. the in the Tim Burton version from 2010, she was screaming and she was falling so fast and like sure it it sold is like maybe she's a little fearful of it in the book um, and they really sold it that way in '85 with all this lightning and thunder, which was yeah. stupid in my opinion. But I do always like judge that on all the adaptations because. Every single drawing or like illustration a person has done of her falling down the hole is so colorful and fantasy and whimsical and well in the 1950s version too what we pointed out what was really cool about that was like there was like little little chests of drawers and things that she was falling down and she like grabs a book off of the shelf and like starts like She's casually not reading scared. it it's it's curiouser and curiouser and like yes it, you know there, that speaks a lot to the idea that this is dreamlike this is not something to be afraid yes. of it is a wonderland like it she is she fell know. down a hole in that movie and fell into a wonderland which at the end of the movie is just in her head it's a dream exactly so to make it this terrifying, horrifying thing, yeah, and then I know what you're going to say about the Tim version Burton. Tim, Tim, Tim Burton, Burton version. <laughs> Tim Burton version just... She fell, she fell on the ceiling of the room and then fell down onto the floor of the room and like... I mean, just the beating she took in that first like minute of being in that room, was I was dramatic. just like, I was like, okay, like, I'm like, so she's dead. <laughs> Something I think is really worth mentioning in the Tim Burton version is everyone thought it was a different Alice. So is this yeah. a continuation or is this like a, on repeat? Is this, are you trying to say that she has this dream a lot so she comes in as a different version or does this just happen to everyone named Alice in this version of the story? Well, that being said, what I will say is, is let's draw some comparisons here. So when she meets the caterpillar in both versions, he's asking her who she is. And in the Tim Burton version, it's alluding to that she's not the right Alice or whatever. And like, like she doesn't know herself. And what I'm, I, what I really feel like this is all leading up to is like what you said, like why make her a hero? Where like I feel like they're like, you don't know what you're capable of, and like you're not the hero we, we need right now. You need to become the hero we need, kind of a thing. Well, and, yeah, and that's obnoxious. All the characters, all the characters in that movie, even when again I disagree with the way it was portrayed of her being in a room with like sixty different doors, really dramatically like that. They were peeping through the keyholes saying, I don't think this is the right Alice. So well, they we were said, like, don't, doesn't she that. remember from last time is what they said. I thought somebody said, I don't think this is the right Alice. And then when they confronted her after that huge jabberwocky thing tried to attack her and they took its eye out, everyone was like, yeah, you're not the right Alice. And yeah. she's like, I'm not going to fight because then they told her, according to some story map thing they roll out, she's supposed to fight a dragon. Yeah, and they brought lore that's what the into right Alice, Alice would do. dude. <laughs> we're like, we're Lord of the Rings, Alice in Wonderland. So the, there's something to be know. said about that, though. <laughs> so that means that thanks to something like Lord of the Rings, now we can't just, now every movie has to be an epic like it has to be a hero's journey. Mhm. And like it, what's interesting about the the rolling out the map and the lore about that too is that I mean, I don't know if anyone who's listening can tell we really flip and hated this movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh this movie because here's the thing like you said like is this meant to be a continuation? Then why call it Alice in Wonderland. Why not call it Return to Wonderland or something? Because they needed to get butts in the seats. And they knew yeah. if they titled it Alice in Wonderland, everyone would line up to see the live adaptation of Alice in Wonderland done by Tim Burton. And they played us, man. They, they played, played us like on a our nostalgia. <laughs> they know that all of us that grew up with Disney, most of us, not all of us, but most of us have children. Some of mm-hmm. our, like, even into the older generation that you know saw that in the 50s 60s and 70s they've got grandkids and they're like we'll just take you to this movie and it also like plays on their nostalgia yeah we got played for sure 
I had high hopes for it because visually you give me all the color and I'm a sucker for life, but there was it no was color. Such <laughs> a in the beginning, it was uh, it was muted, muddied color, yeah. but it was a it did the fantasy of the mushrooms and her being small once she fell down the hole and got through the door. Like I appreciated that for a second, but then when they brought that Jabberwocky situation and I was done. And that, then So as, that wasn't the Jabberwocky. That was just like a tiger or something. Because remember, the Jabberwocky is oh, like right. a dragon. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She just had a different name for it than that she became friends with that, like, I just don't. So, I mean, we could we could elaborate more and more off the oh, Burton I could version. Go on for a while. Um, but let's <laughs> let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, a better adaptation. Um, yes, and, and done in a different right. Medium too, and and not even just a better adaptation, but a genuine continuation of the Alice yes. story. So, Alice: The Madness Returns was my first introduction into American McGee's Alice in Wonderland. Um, I hadn't even heard of the first one, um, but you uh, you had talked highly about that sequel, Madness Returns, and then we ended up playing that together about three years ago now. And then I know that you on your own channel on YouTube had didn't done a playthrough um, with was like last year. Uh, yeah, I think so. So within the recent year, um, what are your thoughts? Um, I'll say this... like as far as adaptation, because this is something this is one thing I'll say. This version is very dark. Um, oh, this is extremely. what Tim Burton's version could have been. And could have been phenomenal if it went like this direction. But what are your thoughts on this take of Alice? I think when we talk about comparing different adaptations where we think Tim Burton's was hot garbage, mm -hmm. nicely put, I think American McGee's Alice, I'm not referring to his first video game, but the second video game of Alice Madness Returns, Literally in the title says it's a sequel, and I think it was done so phenomenally well. Even playing it now, because that came, I think the game came out in 2011, and playing it now, and it, when I played it in 2021, and I'll probably play it again for the future in 2022, the graphics hold up pretty well. But apart from that, the story itself is a continuation but it is extremely dark and gruesome and gory and awful and swings on alice having a lot of extreme mental health and the wonderland is her escape from her horrible life it's just a very dark extreme version of what lewis carroll intended the story to be and not even just her horrible life because what i think american mcgee did was he kind of elaborated a bit and combined the real life alice's tragedies with alice in wonderland and so it's not so much escaping her horrible life but escaping a trauma and i think that's yes. what's so unique about that story is her diving into wonderland to escape a trauma that happened to her um and, you know, and kind of unsuccessfully in Madness Returns, really. Well, so it, I think it's just so flawlessly done comparatively to Burton's version. Because yes. for one, it's not a retelling, it's a continuation, but it still brings in all the stories of that. And it gives us a different version of Alice. Her dress sure starts that way as like the blue dress with the white apron. It's like bloodstained though, isn't it? Obviously, <laughs> yes. Uh, not instantly, but it, yeah. through portions of it, it is. But, you know, it's it speaks to video games where you have multiple different versions of an outfit. You have multiple different levels. But each level of the game, I think, does it so gracefully, which sounds weird for such a morbid game. It does it like justice of hitting on each revisiting of what the story of Alice in Wonderland is because hmm. we have the walrus and she fights some of the same kind of enemies it's very like hacker slasher status of everything yeah it's a hack and slash but game it is but i i think it it just and of course you know i think maybe it i may be how do I say this? Again, touching on my biases here, it is everything that I ever would want out of the story because I am a fan of horror and mm -hmm. thriller genre. So it gives me that while giving me the fantasy of Alice. Right. And it touches all of those details of the character and the story in its own way, but it's still trying to be a continuation. So it 
pays homage to all that stuff and it sprinkles it throughout visuals and storytelling of it. But it's not the same story. It's just, it's close enough that you know the story. Like, especially if you've read the book or you've seen the 51 version or any other movies, you know what the story is. It's very, you, you can't deny that. But it's its own standalone. Well, I think it, it, it does it tastefully while being really disgusting. About it, it, it speaks true to it being a sequel called Madness Returns. And what I think is interesting about the idea of titling it madness is you know it also plays on the mad hatter theme as well of just like we're all mad here kind of stuff like i think what's interesting about that game's story is that it delves it delves deep into the mental illness side of things in the sense of like how we can we can create entire entire new stories to hide the truth from ourselves and what they did what they executed really well was you know her believing that i think in that game if i'm not mistaken like there is some belief that she caused the fire that killed her parents and all that kind of stuff it or, she is led to believe that and yeah. the, the not to be too spoiler about this or even to um the whole premise of what wonderland is for her is her escape almost to be her peaceful side of reality and the therapist in this tries to destroy that he but he convinces her it's her doing it and that she is absolutely mad so that right there is a unique twist too is they bring a therapist they bring a you know a, an a psychoanalyst into the story to talk to her about specifically about wonderland like she she divulges everything about wonderland to this guy and he uses that against her oh he um, manipulates it's, it's her own it's her own madness that's the the whole game is a premise of the the whole game is a premise of uh Alice returning to Wonderland and it's starting to be destroyed and there's this great like there's this great um analogy of the train that's like running through Wonderland destroying everything and it's this psycho it's this therapist who's using Wonderland against her to where it's actually her destroying Wonderland because of his influence Oh, and it's so manipulative. It's extremely manipulative. It's so dirty. But just another and, and great adaptation. Ending, the ending to that story is probably one of the most disgusting things you would ever want to equate with Alice. Yeah. And the only thing I'll touch on about that is I think that was specifically done because of rumor-based things about Lewis Carroll and Alice Little. Right. Well, I feel like overall, I, I don't even like calling that one an adaptation because it is it is a genuine fresh take and that yeah that's the whole reason i wanted to bring that game up compared to like tim burton's film because we talked about like even aesthetically like the look of the game is very burton-esque and it's so funny how it was such a missed opportunity for him i think as a director to make a better film than what he made and i would like to try and sit down and watch through the looking glass to see if there's Oof. But I don't. I don't even know <laughs> if I want to bring myself to do it because I, I just feel like it's going to be more of the same. But this I game. I think. Well, I think American McGee has even classified that he not classified but stated, however you want to say it, that he took great inspiration from everything of Tim Burton. That's hilarious. It, That's is really everything hilarious. through his claymation, especially like Nightmare Before Christmas, even into Corpse Bride, because this game didn't come out until 20, 2011. Holy smokes. <laughs> Got that? So, yeah, I was going to say 2017 for some reason, but I don't know why. <laughs> well, and what's interesting, again, is I just feel like it's a it's a it's a great comparison to bring up how you can how you can take a property and it doesn't have to play on nostalgia necessarily. The idea of the nostalgia for the game is there in the sense that we all know the story of Alice. But story. this is telling you, hey, imagine if it was like this, though. Imagine it more in a real world setting, quote unquote, of like this girl dealing with Mental trauma. issues. Yeah. And like imagine, you know, and it's just a game, but it's a the story of that game is really well done in the sense of how you can continue that Alice in Wonderland story and do a fresh take on that Alice in Wonderland story and and yeah. not even have to use nostalgia to get an audience for it. No, I mean, that's what got a lot of people into it, for sure, because we know the story, but I think so many of us were desperate to see it done in a different way, not yeah. so peachy and cutesy. 
which she still has aspects of that. Her Wonderland in the game is beautiful, and I I definitely encourage anyone that plays video games. It's on Steam. It's on Origin. It's on Xbox. I'm yeah, sure it's, it's on, on Game like Pass PlayStation, for PlayStation. It's on everything. So it's it's a different take, but I love it. I think it's one of those things where it really is it really is just sad to see like how the medium of video games, which doesn't get a whole, I mean, it's getting more credit these days than it used to as far as storytelling, but like the medium of a video game could have done a better job retelling or revisiting a character or a story than, than someone who has so much clout in Hollywood, like Tim Burton. Yeah. He just gets to make films because of his name and he'll never be questioned. I feel like. Yeah, probably not. Because I, I, I don't know many people who don't, like, like this movie. Like, I don't know anyone who's talked crap about Alice in Wonderland, like the Tim Burton version. Um, well, here I am. Th- I've right. arrived. <laughs> well, that's my point, though. Is like So that was an, a big reason why I wanted to do this one, too, because, uh, as our topic, because I was just like, I you know, this movie is garbage. And I don't know why more people aren't, like, pissed off that we got played. Because um, that's how I feel, is like... Again, if it was a continuation, then then be bold and go that route. But but yeah. to call it Alice in Wonderland just to really play off of that nostalgia and to get people in seats, I thought was really insulting. So honorable mentions. One thing I want to say about this for sure is I found a list. Again, just how broad this reaches. I found a list, which I'm not going to read here. We can probably link it on YouTube or whatever. But it's a list of everyone that has come forth saying that they have used the Alice in Wonderland story as um, like a spark or inspiration for different books, different movies, different music. And I thought that was really fascinating because a lot of people will use the same style of character or something related to it in multiple different ways. And I thought that was really interesting to see. So I guess that's one thing I'll say then too. Do you feel like the Burton version is inspiring? No. Not at all. No. Yeah, I'd agree. Which is a shame because is. I do genuinely like a lot of his stuff. Right. Well, and for me, it's like I genuinely like a lot of his earlier stuff. Like, like even when you talked about like James and the Giant Peach and stuff, I kind of forgot he did that movie. Like, yeah. And aesthetically, that movie kind of works for him. Um, it does. I, I remember the visuals of that movie and, I, and comparing it to the book. I was like, yeah, that actually all kind of worked well. That made sense. He was... He, so it, I think it just goes to show even more how much he was capable of adapting a book into a movie. Mm-hmm. So it just goes, again, to speak even further to so he had a track how record. much he messed that up. <laughs> yeah, he had a track record. And I think that another interesting thing I'll make note of is, so we talked about kind of a waste of Johnny Depp, also a waste of Alan Rickman. They had Alan Rickman as the cat- caterpillar in that movie, and... I mean, his voice alone was really good for that role, but they didn't hardly do anything with it. And it, that's just the kind of stuff that really disappoints me. You know what I really feel most about that version was he wanted the title for nostalgia. He wanted to stick his hand in it because his own artistic creation, whatever. But I feel like it was almost like pieces were copy and pasted in there of the story, almost like how I feel about the 1985 version Mm. of like things were copy and pasted in there to sell it as something that it wasn't. Yeah. And that's why I was so disappointed in that. They give you like just enough because they still have the, the tea yeah, party scene Yeah, because they have stuff, a girl like, they name Alice right. and they have the queen in there and she had the flamingos and played croquet and like I get that stuff. But like right. I really thought it was stupid personally to have the white witch in there. I didn't even touch on this. The white, white witch, witch is the four white through the, or yeah, the white witch. <laughs> <laughs> The White Witch. The way, so yeah, it could be. <laughs> the White Queen, because she is in the second half of the story or the sequel of Through the Looking Glass. But then he makes a whole Through the Looking Glass movie. Yeah. So then why do you have her in this first version, which literally doesn't line up with literally any part of Alice in Wonderland's 
the original story. It's character set up and payoff, man. Well, that's why I we gotta know. watch it. <laughs> he just wanted to have a fight between sisters, I guess. But yeah. I'm 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 always going to fight against and this just like sidetracks in a way of like what I was reading to you about in that book about Wonder Woman and stuff. Like, what the hell is this hero's journey? And why can't a story just be a story? Why does everyone always have to fight? Mm -hmm. Why does everything always have to like, I'm winning? Like, it is, I hate it. It makes me angry. And I don't like it. They really made it like a good versus evil thing, right? And I thought yes. that was really interesting because, again, looking at the 1950s version, it was like, especially if you look at the end of that movie where she's like running away from everyone, she runs all the way back through the dream, basically. Like she runs and she falls into the water again and she just keeps going backward and all this stuff. And then she just wakes up. And I thought that that was a very unique way to end that movie. Whereas yes. this one, like, yeah, it was like she literally fought a fucking dragon. <laughs> like, I'm always I going to champion making a female figure a protagonist in something but then again with women in power thing that i've been talking to you about just like what the hell why does she have to get in a suit of armor and fight a dragon well it's like does a protagonist have to have an antagonist you know what i mean like, I can, guess. You, can you have one it, without the other like that's apparently the other side he seems to think not <laughs> yeah well to be fair to be fair I don't know if she actually fought a dragon, but that's where the movie was saying it was going to go because we didn't finish watching it. I didn't. I couldn't. Yeah. I skimmed through. I had to get all the way through. And then at the end, it was... I couldn't. We gave it the college try. Like, we probably made it three quarters through that film. But, like, yeah, when it, it started done. leading up to that and she got the sword and stuff, <laughs> I was like, a fucking sword? Like, what when the hell we... is going on? Like... When we were watching it and you were like, if she fights a fucking dragon, I'm out. And I was like, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Dude, I was, yeah, uh-uh. Alice in Wonderland fighting a dragon. Come what on. a hot garbage mess. So. So was this needed in your opinion? Because mine is No. No, no, no. Apart from Tim Burton, no. Why was this needed? A couple things. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. I agree with you. No. But what I will say to this from a corporate standpoint. So I don't know if you were old enough to remember. In the 90s, Disney would open up the vault and they would release a movie yes. that they hadn't done in a while. You know why they did that, right? It wasn't because it was like the 25th anniversary of Pinocchio. It was because they had to maintain rights to the stories. And so I feel like this is one of those, I think this is one of those instances, the same thing with all their live actions that they've been coming out with. All these adaptations have been coming out so they can maintain the rights to these, to these stories. And so I but think that, that was a big reason. that doesn't make sense because copyright itself works as the story. You don't have to continue to make well, not if it's a, not if it's a, not if it's something you purchase though to maintain the rights. So like Disney purchased the story to make Walt Disney's Alice in Wonderland. I remember those commercials coming out on TV where they're like, "We're opening the vault." Yeah, I yeah. entirely, in the child mind, misunderstood it as like. This is the last time anyone yes. can ever buy or watch this movie Another ever. great get on your nostalgia. And that, yes. that, was, that was them playing our parents. <laughs> yes, I was like, oh my God, I don't have this on VHS. Yeah. I'm never, ever going to see it again. You know, because so, I never thought we'd watch stuff on internet and the, on the internet. No. Like there wouldn't be streaming and all this stuff. Well, then they, they would do the same thing for DVDs many years later too. And so I yeah. think that this was made partially to make money because i'm sure this movie made money this movie um i think I, it was made too because he he didn't have that and he hadn't done a whole lot at least from my understanding in recent years well i mean he's kind of dipped his toe in everything why not add this such a cool story to well your he, you gotta remember stuff? the studio picks the director the director doesn't pick the movie so they they picked Burton for a reason. Um, and I think, you know, like you, you made a really good point about like James and the Giant Peach and stuff. And they're like, oh, this is here's a guy. Yeah, he's got a history with right. animated stuff or his claymation work. Right. Uh, he's that's kind of a big he's kind of goes on both sides of real life human beings like example, Sleepy Hollow, Big Fish, like Beetlejuice, all of that kind of stuff, which had its own little whimsy in it. So was this needed? No. Um, no. This was this was a, a cash grab. This was no one asked for this, and I could say the no. same for any one of the live adaptations that Disney's put out. But nobody asked for this, <laughs> and there's a reason why nobody asked for it is because there's a reason nobody asked for it, and it's because 
we all remember fondly the one we grew up watching. And that's just, that's good enough, in my opinion. It's not, apparently. I think yeah. it, this also calls attention to, or the reality of, here we are, 150 years later, since the story was written in 1865, and it's not going to stop. So much so, when you look on IMDb, there is a new Alice in Wonderland story that is supposed to be made into a movie. They don't have actors yet. They don't have a director yet, but it's already slated to be starting production. Damn. It's just never going to stop. I don't think it ever will. It's too adaptable. It's too easy to find yourself in this girl, especially growing up. Um, even not even just the girl, but the story, the being curious about life and the adventure and wanting to see things probably with some rose colored glasses on. Like anyone can find themselves in that story, especially in their childhood. And I don't think it will ever stop. So one thing I'm curious about. Interesting. So just as a last note, Alice in Wonderland, 1951. 84% on Rotten Tomatoes tomato meter and a 78% audience score. Alice in Wonderland 2010, 51% tomato meter, 55% audience score. It is garbage. So <laughs> it, it definitely was not as well received as if the original. If that was someone's first, like our son situation, if that was somebody's first, I guess, introduction to Alice, then that's what you would think is the story. Right. I mean, that exactly. It's and that's, only garbage to us because that's not how we know the story. That's not the book. That's not the version I grew up with. That's not what I've fantasized and loved about the story my whole life. I think that's the thing that upsets me the most. That, that thing, that's what upsets me the most. Um, it, it doesn't... How can that be? Holy cow. Alice in, <laughs> Alice in Wonderland 2010... Made $1.025 billion. Again, nostalgia. And that's Specifically how it Specifically done how it because works. they knew we would take our kids. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. They knew the generation before us would take their grandkids. That's insane. It's a name. It's a well-known, well-recognized name. You slap Tim Burton on it and it's done. It's done. It's easy. It's sold. You're there. You're taking your kids. You're taking your grandkids. You're going to see it by yourself if you don't have either because you just know the story. Yeah, that's and insane. And it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. I wholeheartedly agree. And we were taken for a ride. <laughs> so, I think that about wraps things up. Yeah. Yeah. So, I want to thank my lovely co-host, Cassandra, for joining me with this podcast we are going to be doing monthly podcasts on this channel um the next film the next piece of nostalgia that we're going to dive into is nostalgia uh, so nostalgia for me is i'm sure different than nostalgia for you but i think this film we both kind of agree at least is something we've seen in our lives and grew up watching even though it wasn't from necessarily our era but um the next film in question the next story in question is going to be uh, one that you might need a golden ticket for. Spoilers, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I know that we're going to be working on a Patreon link that um, may or may not be down below of this podcast. Um, if not, it'll be in the next one. If not, it'll be in the next one. And please feel free to subscribe and check out the other things we're going to be trying to do throughout the month. Um, I feel like we're going to try to do some tie-ins for the Willy Wonka. Um, this is kind of the ma maiden voyage of the podcast, so we didn't have a whole lot of other things tied in with Alice in Wonderland, but we might maybe throw a little a little playthrough of some Madness Returns on the channel just for funsies, um, just where we could talk and, and kind of have some fun with it. But yeah, appreciate everyone's ears. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I hope it generated some conversations for you and some thoughts on what other pieces of nostalgia from your life that have been stolen. Um, but until we meet again, TTFN. Bye!